Chapter 20, The Toy Tinker We left the Boniface estate on the 1st of May, said Nicodemus. We knew a lot more than when we went in. We had been there eight months. Then, said Justin, we found the toy tinker. They were back in Nicodemus's office. Mr. Ages, having rested, sat with them. Not quite yet, said Mr. Ages. No, said Nicodemus, that was in late summer. When we first got out, we began searching for a place to live permanently, or at least a place where we could stay as long as we wanted. We had a pretty clear idea of what we were looking for. We had had plenty of time to talk about it on the long winter evenings in the library between reading books. The reading we did, we knew very little about the world, you see, and we were curious. We learned about astronomy and about electricity, biology, mathematics, and about music and art. I even read quite a few books of poetry and got to like it very well. But what I liked best was history. I read about the ancient Egyptians, the Greeks and Romans, and the Dark Ages when the, whole, when the old civilizations fell apart and the only people who could read and write were the monks. They lived apart in monasteries. They led the simplest kind of lives and studied and wrote. They grew their own food, built their own houses and furniture. They even made their own tools and their own paper. Reading about that, I began getting some ideas of how we might live. Most of the books were about people. We tried to find some about rats, but there wasn't much. We did find a few things. There were two sets of encyclopedias that had sections on rats. From them, we learned that we were about the most hated animals on Earth, except maybe snakes and germs. That seemed strange to us and unjust, especially when we learned that some of our close cousins, squirrels, for instance, and rabbits, were well-liked. But people think we spread diseases, and I suppose possibly we do, though never intentionally, and surely we never spread as many diseases as people themselves do. Still, it seemed to us that, a, that the main reason we were hated must be that we always lived by stealing. From the earliest times, rats lived around the edges of human cities and farms, stowed away on men's ships, gnawed holes in their floors, and stole their food. Sometimes we were accused of biting human children. I didn't believe that, nor did any of us, unless it was some kind of sub-normal rat, bred in the worst of city slums, and that, of course, can happen to people, too. We ha had we, then, no use at all in the world? Our encyclo One encyclopedia had a sentence of praise for us. The common rat is highly valued as an, as an experimental animal in medical research due to its toughness, intelligence, versatility, and biologically similarity to man. We knew quite a bit about that already. But there was one book written by a famous scientist that had a chapter about rats. Millions of years ago, he said, rats seemed to be ahead of all the other animals, seemed to be making a civilization of their own. They were well organized and built quite complicated villages in the fields. Their descendants today are the rats known as prairie dogs. But somehow it didn't work out. The scientist thought maybe it was because the rats live the lives were too easy while the other animals especially the monkeys were living in the woods and getting tougher and smarter the prairie dogs grew soft and lazy and made no more progress eventually the monkeys came out of the woods walking on their hind legs and took over the prairies and almost everything else it was then that the rats were driven to become scavengers and thieves living on the fringes of a world run by men. Still, it's interesting to us that for a while, at least, the rats had been ahead. We wondered if they had stayed ahead, if they had gone on and developed a real civilization, what would it have been like? Would rats, too, have shed their tails and learned to walk erect? Would they have made tools? 
Probably, though we thought not so soon and not so many, a rat has a natural set of tools that monkeys lack, sharp pointed teeth that never stop growing. Consider what the beavers can build with no tools but their rodent teeth. Surely rats would have developed reading and writing, judging by the way we took to it. But what about machines? What about cars and airplanes? Maybe not airplanes. After all, monkeys living in trees must have felt a need to fly, must have envied the birds around them. Rats may not have that instinct. In the same way, a rat civilization would probably never have built skyscrapers, since rats prefer to live underground. But think of the endless subways, below subways, below subways they would have had. We thought and talked quite a bit about all this, and we realized that a rat civilization, if one ever did grow up, would not necessarily turn out to be anything at all like human civilization. The fact was, after eight months in the Boniface estate, none of us was sorry to move out of it. It had given us shelter, free food, and education, but we were never really comfortable there. Everything in it was designed for animals who, look, who looked, moved, and thought differently from the way we did. Also, it was above ground, and that never felt quite natural to us. So when we left, we decided that our new house should be underground, preferably if we could find it a cave. But where? We thought hard and studied maps and atlases. There were plenty of those in the study. Finally, we reached some conclusions. To find a cave, we would have to go where there were mountains. There aren't any caves in flatlands. And for food, it would have to be near a town, or better, a farm. So we wanted to find a farm, preferably a big one with a big barn and silos full of grain near the mountains. We studied the map some more, and it was Jenner, I think, who spotted this area as a good place to look. On the map, a big part of it was covered with contour lines that show mountains, and across these were written the words, Thorn Mountains National Forest. Beneath that, in smaller letters, it said, Protected Wilderness Preserve. Bordering this, where the mountains turn to foothills, the map shows showed rolling country with quite a few roads, but hardly any towns, which we thought ought to mean farmland. We were right, as of course you now know. It took us two months of steady traveling to get to the Thorn Mountain National Forest, but we found it. We're under the edge of it right now, and there are plenty of caves, most of them never visited by people because people aren't allowed to drive into the wilderness preserve. There aren't any roads in the forest, but only a few jeep trails used by rangers, and airplanes are not permitted to fly over it. We looked at a lot of caves, some big, some small, some dry, but most damp, before we chose this cave. In this farm, however, we found the toy tinker. It began as a sad sort of thing. We found an old man lying in the woods one morning near one of the jeep trails not so far from here and he was dead we don't know what he died of we guessed it must have been a heart attack he was dressed in a black suit old-fashioned in style but neat not ragged his hair was white and his face looked gentle i wonder who he was and where he was going justin said Whoever he was, Jenner said, he wasn't supposed to be in here at all. We ought to bury him, I said. So we did, not by digging a grave, but by covering him with high mound of leaves and stones and twigs and earth. It was, a gathering it was in gathering material for this mound that Justin made the secondary discovery. He was back in the bushes, out of sight. Look here, he called. I found a truck. It was... A very ancient truck with a small round hood, but it had been lovingly polished and it was wonderfully shiny. The body, which was square and large, had been rebuilt and painted red and gold. It had little windows with white curtains 
and between them, lettered in gold, were signs. The Toy Tinker. Toys, repairs, hobby kits, model sets, electric toys, all work guaranteed. Obviously, the truck had belonged to the old man. He was a peddler and mender of toys. The red and gold wagon was his shop and his home. He had driven into the woods to camp for the night. It was against the law, of course, so he had concealed the truck behind some bushes off the trail behind a big beech tree. We could see where he had made a campfire, carefully surrounding it with stones and clearing away the bush so he, he would not set the woods afire. Beyond the beech tree, a narrow brook flowed. It was a peaceful spot. We could see what had probably caused the old man's death. One wheel of the truck had sunk into the soft earth and was stuck. A shovel lay near it. He had been driving to dig it out, trying to dig it out. The work had been too hard for him, and he had started to go for help when he collapsed. This much we could figure out just by looking. Then someone said, whose truck is it now? It belongs to his heirs, I said. Whoever they are, said Jenner, he may not even have any. He seems to have been alone. Anyway, said someone else, how would they ever find it? That's true, I said. We don't know who, have, who he was. And if we did, we have no way of notifying anyone. So I suppose if we want it, the truck is ours. Why don't we see what's in it? But that will be for the next chapter.